Hello there, YouTube. I hope you're doing well today. I just want to make a quick video highlighting some tips and tricks I've found along the way working with MuseScore, especially as it's undergone a lot of really wonderful updates in the last few years. This is the score we're going to be using today to highlight some of the points I'm trying to make here. I used a lot of the tricks that I've learned over the years to sort of bend Muse score to my will. As one of my composition teachers said once, you have to bend these programs to your will. They're, they're very finicky almost all the time. You need to just become intimately aware with all of the menus and features, and you need to uh, just experiment. Lots of trial and error with this kind of stuff. So just place everything as you like it as far as dynamics go. Uh, try to get the best sound you can and then come back later and then try to touch it up because the most important thing is you to write your music, not you to be fighting the notation system all day. So you can come back and clean things up later. So this is the cleaning up process here. You'd come to the mixer and so you'll immediately see that I have a lot of things changed and moved around. I'll start from top to bottom here. Most of the time MuseScore picks out some good things by default, but I, I always come through, you know, sometimes the clarinet in B-flat, I might want the one in E-flat. Uh, bassoon is usually always great. Here's a big thing with brass. It By default, it will pick, if you have Muse Brass here, it will pick horn in F. If you write something for French horn, it almost always puts horn in F. But down here it says horns A6. And this is multiple horns sounding at the same time. And I think that in most cases this sound effect is better. And you'll see that it, there's a trombone, trombone A3, trumpet, and then trumpets, plural. So I almost always, especially in a large orchestration, pick the one that is you know, multiple instruments. Don't just pick the singular one. Uh, and you'll find that in the string section as well. I love the bass trombone sound in here, by the way, everybody. If you are writing a piece and you're like, the bass is just, it doesn't have that bite that some of my favorite, you know, film scores or something like that has. I have found that if you put this bass trombone in here, you put them fairly close to the tuba and you give them similar lines. And this is something that orchestrators do a lot. I mean, it's not like I came up with this idea, but I mean, in, in terms of music, score. The percussion is wonderful, but I have found that it is very, very loud at times. So glockenspiel here is pulled way down. The snare drum, which I love, it sounds wonderful, but I got to pull it way down. Um, all sorts of things like that. But by default, they have wonderful sounds. And if you see here in Muse Sounds Percussion, look at all the things they give you. And I think every one of them is like wonderful. I don't really have a problem with any of them that I've tried so far. I have a tambourine here pulled way down as well. You'll notice way down in the negatives. Now we're on to our strings at the bottom of the page here. So we have violins, like I said, pulled way down. And violas pulled up a little higher, cellos a little higher, and then basses. And now the last thing I want to call your attention to on the mixer page is the panning, the panning angle. So how much of, of it do you want coming out of the left ear? Or do you want the trombones coming more out of the right ear? And it sort of gives the illusion that you're sitting in, I guess, a concert hall with, with a lot of instruments spread all around you. And so you're kind of getting the music from different angles and at different levels. So that is where this panning comes into effect. It's a little dial that you can pull left or right. The positive numbers mean it's off to the right, like the visual shows here. Negative means, of course, off to the left. Pick out some things that make sense, obviously. The first one's going to be like, what's pulled the furthest to the left? What's all the way to the left on the orchestra? And it would be, well, I, what comes to my mind, at least, is the violin section. All the violins there on the left side of the conductor. And so here I have violins pulled 32 to the left. I try to keep it fairly centralized. You can pull them even farther than I'm doing here. Feel free to do so. I think it, it you might get some good results. But in my scores so far, I've tried to keep them a little bit tighter just so you don't get too much sound out of one ear and nothing out of the other. Although I've listened to some recordings recently where it's like completely left and right you know it's just all the sounds are coming out of one ear and all the other sounds are coming out of another ear and it sometimes works so uh experiment with that a bit but go through this and try to pick some natural things like i said the the violin should be off to the left the cellos would be off to the right but here's the trick your basses your low voices i think when it comes to recording 
is, is, you know, you might have the bass players all the way off to the right behind the cellos. I totally get that. But in your recording, do you want the basses to only come out of your right ear? Like, I don't think it's going to be way too boomy out of one ear. It's going to completely overshadow anything else going on. Uh, I think it's going to distract from your piece. So be careful about that. You'll notice all my bass voices, the timpani that comes up. Bass trombone's a little off to the right because I kind of have him in the treble area at times. He's kind of up there with trombones. So figure out these instruments and what you want to use. Do you want it to sound like a really prominent snare in your in your piece? And if so, you might want to pull that snare part up higher than I have it up here. In this piece, I want the snare in the background. So I, you need to make those sort of decisions for yourself. I said, place all of your dynamics, just leave the things as they are, and then come back to it later. So now here we are coming back to it later, and you want to refine a section. So let's say I want to get all the dynamics just right for this intro. I'm going to take the flutes, the very top voice, whatever you have, click in that measure in any open space. I'm going to hold down shift, and I am going to click the very bottom measure I have here of this page. I just want to hear this first page, nothing beyond this. So click on the double bass line down here in my case. And now, while that's selected, it'll it'll hold that for you. Just click loop playback, and you will get these little arrows here, you'll see, uh, that pop up. And that just means it's going to loop this. If you click play, well, let's see what it does. And then you see there, of course, it loops back. So that's that's the benefit of the loop. So if you just want to work with that, you could loop it just in that one little moment and let it just keep playing. And while it's playing, you can come down here and work on your panning angle. And in the moment, go, oh, no, I, want, I liked when the horn was off to the right or off to the left. Figure all that stuff out there. One last thing I'll say here, and I, I don't really mess with reverb in this too much. They have some wonderful reverb sounds. I'm not going to get into that right now. They have one they put here by default. I turn it up about halfway, and then I do all of my uh, mastering later in Audacity. Some examples of these trombones being too loud, let's say, or any instrument here being too loud. Right here, let's listen to this section, just the brass. And this is another clever trick I'll show you. This one's for free. Look at this. You click on the instrument you want to hear. So let's, I want to hear this tuba part here. And I'm going to shift and click the French horn part. Now what that does is selects everything between those two. And when I press play, I will only hear these instruments. Let's listen to what's going on here. And these trombones are going to try to overpower everybody if I don't do something about it. So you'll notice here, what have I done? So I have a forte marked, but then I have in gray, you'll notice this guy right here this mezzo forte. And that's because I want it to be forte when I'm in rehearsal because I know what trombone players, they're going to go, oh, I want, we're all playing forte. We're all playing loud. I got it. But in Muse score, uh, they get a little too enthusiastic in the trombone section. So you have to calm them down with a mezzo forte every now and then. How you do that is you'll come up here to view um, you can go to palettes or I go to master palette a lot of the times for some reason, because I'm weird like that. I get all of my options here. And so what I'm going to do is go to dynamics. Let me get rid of this mezzo forte here. Let's hear how loud these trombones are without that mezzo forte. So you see right there, it's like, da -da -dun -dun -da -da. they get way too loud. And, and it just like, it ruins the whole line for me. And trumpets kind of are a little too loud too there. I don't really love that, but I'll talk to them later. Um, so I put this mezzo forte in here. So I just click on the note I want. I click on the mezzo forte, or you could just drag it over, however you want to do it. I make it invisible. It will play as a mezzo forte, but nobody's score will say mezzo forte. Nobody gets to see that other than me right here in the screen. So the way you do that is you click on the mezzo forte and you click V for visible, or at least I assume that's what it is. So very simple. That that one's pretty straightforward. So anytime an instrument is being too loud or or you write a crescendo that you really want to appear on the page, but the instrument just gets way too loud for its own good and it ruins the whole line, well then what you can do is 
put the forte down that you want and then put a mezzo forte on it, make that mezzo forte invisible, boom. Almost all the time that fixes the problem. You'll notice here, I have a lot of the invisible dynamics. That is really the key to it more than almost anything. I don't know why this is like this. Here, let's clean this up real quick. Here, this is cleaning up my score with Dylan. Another thing, at the end, I wanted crescendos. I was running out of room. It was, I, you know, it's debatable if I'm using the right notation. You know, there are a lot of problems with me, but hey, let's not judge. I wanted them to have a crescendo because these new Muse score sound effects, actually, if you write in a crescendo, your instruments will very naturally crescendo to the dynamic you're leading them to. If you don't want the big hairpins on your page, you know, the big crescendo day crescendo guys, uh, these guys right here. So what you would do is just, you know, click where you want to start, you know, this first note of the flute, let's say, and you want to go all the way to the end, you click on that, and then I would click on the crescendo button here, and there you go, you have a crescendo. And then also, if you click on this item, and then you have properties open, and if you don't, you just click on view, go down to properties, and then there you have it. You can click show line, and it usually is clicked by default. Make sure if you're needing some more space on the page that you come in and use a crescendo marking or a diminuendo marking like this instead of the hairpins. It'll save you a little bit of space on the page. Don't, don't forget about those guys. The last thing I wanted to go into, you know, is a little boring, I understand, but you go to format. This format page up here is is wonderful. The, this is how you really get things looking right. Let's go to first style. You open up styles. You come down to text styles, the very bottom one. Here is every single type of text that can show up in your score all in one spot. So the instrument name long. So this is one that comes up a lot. It's the very first ones that you see here. If I was to click the up arrow here, you'll see all of our sizes on the left of the screen change. And then instrument name short is, of course, when you turn the page over here, and then you have your shorter names, there they are. And the way to change things like that, right click it, staff or part properties. You click on that, there you have it, B flat clarinet, and then I, I put my, you know, this is a weird way to do it, but I just wanted to uh, save some room on the page. So I put a two in parentheses because I want two, uh, I want two instrumentalists to play this line and I have it split up a lot. Now that we've got all the textiles worked out in our piece, we can come to formatting again. And now we'll go to page settings. Page settings can be kind of tricky. I'm going to link to a YouTube video that I found recently about the official formatting and page sizes and all of that of orchestral scores and what Hollywood scores use and what they use in Europe versus what they use in the United States. All of that wonderful, wonderful information about page size. But the big thing is the scaling that I want to touch on here and the page margins. The scaling is pretty important. It's just how large the print is going to appear on the page. What is the scale of the print? So let me click the down arrow and everything's going to get much smaller. You'll see everything change dramatically in the background here. So everything bumps down a little bit. They do it by odd pages and even pages, but as you click up, you'll notice a change in your score. So here, as I click up on this odd page top margin, you'll notice the very first page here, it's gonna start getting squished. It's getting squished a little bit. So if I start pulling that back, you know, some people might want a little bit more room at the edge of their page. And one of the major ones I wanna point out is on this left side of the page right here. If you are going to be hole punching some music, uh, anything like that, you're going to need to leave a little bit of room for the margin there so when you hole punch it, it's not going to uh, take a big old bite out of your first few measures. You don't want it to do that. And one last thing in styles that I didn't touch on, here we go, is header and footer. So you click on him, and so the way it has your page numbers listed as well is it's this dollar sign and then a P for the page numbers. And that just means that when you go on to the new page, it's going to cycle to that next page number. And so you can make it where they are all on the right side of the page, all on the left side of the page, however you want it. But this is just what's going to uh, show up on the bottom and the top of your page. If you want to add any little details like that, here's going to be the place to do that. So that's it for this video. I try to make it as quick as possible. I tried to jam in all the best details that I've learned along the way to make my score look a little bit better and sound a little bit better in Muse score. I really appreciate you watching. I hope you got something out of it. Please leave a comment as well and tell us some of your tricks, some things you want me to bring up maybe in the next episode, anything like that. And please like and subscribe. It would mean a lot to me. I really appreciate you watching.